Welcome, guys. It's me, <clears throat> Sue's Pratt, and I'm bringing you part two of um, Time Loop from Hell with Love from Sophia's Emporium. And we're going to kick it off by sharing the screen because, you know, we love to share. And <clears throat> This is a clip from one of my all-time favorite flippin' movies called Just Visiting, and it's a time travel movie. And since we're talking about the uh, potentialities of this 2013 time loop, I thought what better way to kick this off, so welcome. They're gonna save the people in the TV, Vinnie Divine. How you doing, baby? Free them. Bunny? You really think these guys have amnesia? I don't know. Insane. I didn't see that. Oh, come on. Where did they go? I don't They were inside. We could not save them. It's tragic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Andre the servant. He has good boots. And um, that's very important that we have good boots when we're going to run behind a vehicle that goes, you know, 25 miles an hour, right? Okay, so let's get down to this. Where should we begin? I love this. The woman that used to live in this home. Um, before we moved here, she had a bunch of unusual trinkets out in the garden, and this was one of them. So that's why I called it, hey, hey, boo-boo, no crying, because we're going to be talking about some shit. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to cruise you down the road just a little bit, and we're going to zip over. Whoa. I'm talking, but maybe you can't see me. Who knows? That's all right. I'm still here. I want my um, hair shop page. What's going on here, Suze? Maybe it's because I can't see myself. I'm lost. I've fallen down the tunnels of time. Help me, help me. Here we go. And where would I be? I see my name flashing. There I am. Okay. So what I wanted to do was give you a little visual stimulation while I conduct business here. <clears throat> and so on the first episode of Time Loop from Hell, I covered three topics that were very, very near and dear to my heart and um, really could have been the end of me <laughs> without sounding too dramatic in 2013. And it really didn't take more than probably four or five hours before I realized what I forgot to tell you all about. And it really has to do with more you know, your buddy Suze is a professional and a sole proprietor of a business for 30 years, right? So, since I never could or would separate my business from my personal, <clears throat> I hope those of you that have come to know me in our journey realize that that's why I choose to speak about the things that I do because there really isn't 
any division in my life where I can draw a line and say, okay, now, you know, I'm not going to talk to somebody about this particular thing or that. So, hmm, we're looking, huh, you know what? Am I like a goofball or what? We're at Sophia's Emporium, guys. Wrong page. <sighs> Who am I? Oh, right. The holistic stylist. That's what shoes I'm in right now. We want her photos. Yeah, this looks like the hair shop girl. Okay, cool. We're in the right place. So, uh, 2013. <clears throat> Let me show you how beautiful the hair emporium was. And then I'll tell you a little story about what happened to the hair emporium in flipping 2013. Okay. So here you can see that we are in a historic building. This is an original tin roof ceiling that we paid, oh, I believe it was $1,200 to repaint. Um, actually, our friend Sam, his dad, Bob on the job, you know, was who we contracted to do that work. Keep it here local in the city, right? And you can see Joe and I well, really, Joe, I, I just help, right? But Joe laid this beautiful pergo floor, and you can see how much love was put into the presentation. And it's probably one of the weirdest hair shops you ever saw in your life because it's actually a cosmetology museum. So here again, <clears throat> how can we separate things like if we're discussing who I am and what I do. And if I've had something in my home, say my station right here, this was my grandmother's dresser. So if I use it in a particular way at any given time, who's to say what kind of a piece of equipment that is? And that plays in because when you get accused of doing things that you're not doing, these things all become very important. So we uh, sunk a lot of money into this building, well over 60,000 in the uh, few years that we were there. And our landlord, um, a sweet guy by the name of Pope. And you say, well, what's in a name, right? And we also have to talk about slum wars. And, you know, I was a little naive growing up. My dad, the cop, told me that slum wars only existed in the city of St. Louis or, you know, in the inner cities of any state. And we rolled into Ferguson in 2007. And I'm telling you, <laughs> there's so many slum wars down here, man, slinging real estate. It's enough to choke a horse. And the other guy's name is Hearst, and I'm sure y'all remember the Hearst story from back in the day, but we're talking about Pope right now. So Pope had some tenants upstairs. There are four studio apartments located above this floor. And this building is on the historical register, it is known as the Ben Boydell building. So theoretically, it needs to be kept up to a certain standard of excellence, which um, I'm gonna have to tell you, doesn't happen. And believe it or not, I think Pope took this building over in the 80s, in the early 80s. And after he flooded my hair shop, that was the first insurance claim that tight SOB ever filed. So anyhow, he had some tenants that moved out in the middle of the night, you know. And of course, it would be his job to lock the place up and secure it, but it eh, really wasn't important to him and uh, usually wasn't. 
from what I know about Poe. And someone decided to come, you know, party there, come sleep there, come hang out there. I mean, shit, it's a vacant apartment in the ghetto. You know, there's a lot of homeless people that would take advantage of that. So whoever was up there decided to leave the water running. And so I got to work one morning. And, you know, for me, morning's 10 a.m., right? And this had been happening since the night before, obviously, with the volume of water that <clears throat> we took in. But there was a couple inches of water on my entire hair shop floor, y'all. And it was ruined. I mean, just like that. When I came in the shop, I heard water running. And I thought, what the hell? And then I looked down and saw water all over my floor. So it was coming from the ceiling and coming down uh, behind this wall was my bathroom. And so it was flooding from back there. Now, why is this important, you ask, besides the fact it ruined my hair shop, right? Is because it was a lot of stress. And I wrote a letter to my landlord, and this is dated August 30th, 2013, and I'll hold that up. And of course, this is my handwritten original. You know I was almost Susie's secretary. I don't know if you guys know that. Before I got the scholarship to go to beauty school because nobody wanted it. Since I wasn't, um, you know, cut out for the college life, I was going to be a secretary. So this says Pope. As you know, it has now been three months that my salon has sustained considerable damage. Due to no fault of my own, and admittedly due to your own unintended negligence, a second floor vacant apartment, 6D, was left unlocked. Whomever enjoyed their weekend turned water on left and the water emptied into my first floor location. I am respectfully asking that you enact provision 13 of our lease, abating my rent proportionately to the amount of $620 for at least the month of September. Considering no action was taken on the lesser's part for June, July, and August when it comes to assessing the potential mold mildew hazard. And of course, this building was already full of mold and mildew. That's another story, hang on, okay. Although I enjoy a great amount of loyalty on the part of my clientele, some of them have allergies and are chemically sensitive. How can I run a wellness center with a foul odor which would make anyone ill? Sincerely, Susanna B. Pratt. Okay. So what do you do when your hair shop floods and you got clients coming in? <laughs> uh, fortunately, the clients that have been with me a long time have seen many of the stressors and the pitfalls of being a self-employed business person and you roll with the punches. But we, uh, we, re we recommend a product called Rid X. It's old school. And you can find this at some hardware stores and it will absorb the moisture and turn these crystal pellets to big blobs and then eventually to water. We got most of it up that way. And of course, Joe has a shop back, but the thing that really sucked in the end is that Ridex made the Pergo floor like a skating rink. Um, whatever the chemical process was, whatever way it broke down, that was pretty dangerous. And of course, I was getting ready for my big surgery that I discussed in part one. So it was all pretty hellacious. And Keep in mind on our timeline, this is one year before the slaying of Mike Brown and Ferguson. And I'd also like you to consider that, of course, we have to go back and remember 
at the head hair shop here in town that did whatever favors they did at City Hall and gained the TIF money. You know, they didn't want me here because, of course, I was competition, although I was bringing my own clientele. Over 300 clients to shop and be part of a community. So as this all unfolded, of course, it was tough, you know, emotionally too, because I had come here, you know, primarily to restart my life and to be happy and then to be what I considered <laughs> free. Isn't that, isn't that ironic? And the other thing that it was really tough when we look at cycles and we look at these forces that seem to line up against us to destroy um, whatever we've built. When I opened the Hair Emporium in 1985, I was 20 years old. And the reason I opened at 20 wasn't because I had a pile of money. It was because the other hairdressers, they didn't really want to work with me and I didn't want to work with them. And um, when I did work with a couple, I mean, the one was a Coke head, free base and Coke in the back room. And, you know, her mom was wondering where the rent money was. And she was telling her mom that we weren't paying, but she was putting it up her nose. You know, I don't need that shit. And then we went and worked at a shop with this red velvet wallpaper where a nice, um, you know, guy said that it was all gonna be redecorated as we come there and, you know, put our rent money in there and believe in this place. And of course that didn't happen either. They were on the take. And so I knew if I was gonna stay in the industry, I would have to open my own salon. And I've also shared how much I appreciate and love my gram that I grew up with and shared a room with and went through all these things. And, you know, she wanted me to survive. I mean, that was always her wish. And um, she fully supported me when I opened my salon, you know, if I fell short a few dollars on rent or whatever it was, she was there for me. And over the years, the Hair Emporium grew from a one-woman operation um, up to 16 girls at its, at its height. And when you live in the ghetto, in a place where everybody's running and nobody believes a decent hairdresser would even choose to work or operate, you know, of course, you have to be willing to put away your snobability or prejudice or whatever and work with all sorts of people and that was easy for me to do but in the end you know even though Ferguson and Florissant are what they call sister cities Ferguson has had a reputation for being um not so nice of a place to choose to live for many years where Florissant looked like howdy duty land compared to it you see and, and there was even um a lack of harmony between these sister cities like say when i was a child because of course the migrations hadn't spread so much you see now they're both in the same boat you know they're linked back up together and of course that a play in too but I had come from Florissant to Ferguson and um, the girls didn't want to have anything to do with it. And that was okay. I was starting my new life with Joe and um, we all understood. We understood, right? And two of the girls did come with me. One of them was my beauty school teacher, Sheila. And we've always been close over the years. So when you ask, how does a girl like me wind up with a cosmetology museum? A lot of the answer is Sheila, Sheila Schaefer. And uh, she ran a beauty college down here, believe it or not, in Ferguson. 
when I was about five years old. <laughs> so here again, we see the loop. But basically, what you see is a cycle. Because by 2013, I worked solo. The other, the other girls, um, you know, their natural time to be done was at hand. And so I found myself alone again. And sometimes when you're alone, it's scary. <laughs> you know, you think if there's other people around you, you'll be okay. And uh, that was the first time I had been alone since I was 21. So that's my story. And of course, here again, the very man that flooded my place tried to scam me for uh, half of the insurance money. And of course I signed a waiver that, you know, I would not sue him for his ignorance. And, you know, I figure blow me sideways. I can surely talk about it now, especially when he evicted me from this very spot. And technically there is now no street location for the hair emporium. I'd love there to be, but you know, when a town doesn't want you and they blacklist you, how do you bounce into that? And where do you want to work in the ghetto when all the businesses are closing down and we know what time it is, friends? So I look at all this as a blessing because if I would have still been running all this, I wouldn't have converted my business and started the journey online with you guys. So let me see if I can bring you up a few more pictures here. A lot of my antiques, <laughs> the old bottles. There's a bottle called Satanic. It was something to uh, drive the evil spirits out of you. And I know a couple people that need a hit of that, right? Here's Claudia. Some of my grandfather's things. Now this is a machine that you would put one piece of hair in and you would twist the hair to see if it was strong enough to take a permanent wave or a chemical service. Very technical. This is my national accreditation from the American Board of Certified Master Hair Colorist. This means amongst a bunch of people that they think are ding-dongs that I have a PhD in the art of uh, slinging hair color. And that's a whole other story, but I'll tell you what, there's nobody that does it like me. And that has to do with the enzymes and the non-toxic color and the love of the client and the natural God-given art that I have been bestowed with. It had nothing to do with these guys teaching me a new trick. All right. And yeah, I'm still proud to live in Ferguson. You think, shit, she must be nuttier than a fruitcake. Okay. Me at a high school graduation, me as a baby, and me on uh, Santa Claus's lap. Yes, yes, very nostalgic, Suze. All right, so I gotta get out of here. So that means I reduce my screen just a bit, X out, and we're looking at the whole thing again. So you guys hear a little bit about my library here and there, and this would be about one half of the library. And you can see that I do have a lot of historic first edition books. And one of the things I've been doing is, believe it or not, photographing these historic books. And what happened is when I was swept up in the phenomena and I felt like I needed to work with urgency, what books would need to be left for humanity? Important things uh, to restart. 
So I uploaded over 20,000 images to my camera and I have been detailing them and cataloging them in. Oh yeah, you guys are gonna like the books too. All right, so that's the end of those pictures. We'll stop that share. And I'm gonna tell you another story. And this goes back to the hair shop too, and to 2013, into the town of Ferguson. Now, I'm gonna to try to tell the story the best I can, but I might have to ding my bell. Oh no. Way too loud right there. I'm sorry if I just broke anybody's eardrums. Um, I might have to ding my bell or hide my face or do something. It's not an easy story to tell. So we roll into town in 2007. And by 2010, we live here at the big yellow house. Springtime comes, Ian wants to play baseball. And that doesn't sound like it'd be a big thing, but see if you're not in the click down here, you can't play on the baseball team. And we were fortunate enough, you know, that Ian could play somebody, you know, said some really good, important things and it was allowed. <laughs> so Ian's playing ball. And one of the families that run this town, of course, their kid plays on the same team and lives down the street, right? And they like to talk shit on everybody. And there was a woman that they were speaking ill of. And Joe had a little, oh, you know, one of those weeds that get the weed on the end of it, you know, and you can tickle people with it. So Joe had his little thing. And <clears throat> when the woman that was being talked about asked the group of fucking hens, are you talking about me? <laughs> Joe pointed that thing at her and he says, they're talking shit on you. And the woman told Joe, I'm talking about the one that runs the town now, you know, she gives him the face and says like this. And her fucking husband tells him to zip it. <laughs> Now, that's kind of like telling me to shut up and not tell my story. You really don't, you don't really want to invoke that wrath because we'll just, we'll just bring it 10 times more with a lot of humor and a lot of love and piss you off just the same, right? So anyhow, Ian didn't get to play ball anymore. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. I mean, you know, it was the end of the season, of course. And he just couldn't play next year. So, <clears throat> this uh, family also had a daughter. So we've got two adopted kids that are a different nationality than the snooty Rudy mom and dad that run the town, right? And so the little girl who was pre-puberty at that time she really wanted to hang out with us because the uh, cat had had kittens. And of course, you guys know the girls, you know the cats, you see them in the videos. And she wanted to play with wrinkles, you know, the dog. She liked to hang out with the neighbor across the street. And mom and dad told her, you cannot go up the street and be near, you know, these people. I mean, remember, some people think we're the devil. and. That's a whole other story, isn't it? So, the kid grows up, you know? And back in 2013, here she comes up the street and she wants to talk. And, you know, it seems pretty dangerous and, um, Carol was here, the neighbor, and it, it was 
kind of safe. And um, next thing you know, the kid's up here more. The mom even drops her off one day. And the day that it really got terrifying, the mom dropped her off at the hair shop on Church Street. And keep in mind, they were both clients of the salon that made it close to impossible to get into this town. You know, politics. So, the kid's in the shop. She wants to be there. She's told her mom she's coming to work, and I sure don't need her ass working, right? So, from there, things elevated a bit. And the next thing you know, her mama thinks she's hanging out here, but she's really coming up the street and getting in the car with a boy and leaving and coming back and, you know, wanting to hide and smoke cigarettes in our neighbor's yard or, you know, be here and, 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 it was bad, man, because you know you're getting set up. It's it's like, um, you know, when Og talks about the different algorithms in the computer and for every move, they can kick out a whole setting to deal with what's going to happen and how you're going to choose to react. So, this is how your buddy sues got out of that deal. We have a thing down here called Street Fest. And it's a big musical festival. And uh, we used to do the tie-dye with the kids. Of course we volunteered. You guys know us. We also did the gingerbread houses with the kids at, at uh, Northern Lights, which was the Thanksgiving parade. This town loves a good parade. So... Anyhow, this kid has, um, you know, they, they've diagnosed her. She's got issues, and she's on meds. But see, when your parents think you're SpongeBob SquarePants, but you're really partying, it starts to play with the meds. And she told her mom that she was with me all day, and... We were out getting t-shirts and I had to sit her mama down. And I mean, this is one of those women that, you know, if there's enough money, she can buy it and she will have perfection no matter what the cost. So anyhow, I, I told her that I'm not sure what she's talking about. I mean, um, she needs to talk to her daughter because we weren't together. And she says, my daughter does not lie to me. Now, you see, I've been there before because being mama to people, sometimes you get set up for a fall. There's gotta be somebody to blame. And in my experience, it's always been me. If Vic was here, he'd say, well, Suze, why did you pick that for yourself? And I still call bullshit on this because you see when you engage in other people's realities, which you do when you are interacting with them, then what you have is a mesh of things. So did I sign up for these exact torturous things? I don't think it works that way. I think it's more like a skill set. And uh, I've been this place before. And I've been loved so much I've been hated before. And it even happened with that daggum junior wizard, um, baby's daddy of my grandkids. Um, you know, he, he could uh, say he loved me easier than his own mom. Well, I knew that my neck was going to roll. You cannot be that person and see 
unfortunately, that is a role that happens with me. And it's, it's, it's all right. So anyhow, this little girl, absolute nightmare from hell because when you love people, you want to help them. And surely we understood her trauma because, let me put it this way, if you're brown and your mom and dad are tan and then you use the N-word, see, that's a lot of mixed messages for a kid to grow up with. And, you know, more than anything, this kid wanted to know why her real mom didn't want her. And I said to her, sweetheart, I mean, you know, there's a lot of questions that we have that nobody can answer. But one day, you know, that spark of the divine in you and know why. Well, see, that was problematic because she didn't believe in that higher power. And this is a kid that's getting forced to go see the priest every week. So I have a lot of compassion, but when people are puppeted, they really don't mean to do the things they do. But that does not mean that I will engage them. So I don't engage them anymore. And one of the main reasons why is because them and their little socialite group are the very people that make anonymous complaints that get you written up for things that you don't do. You see what I'm saying? We're talking about a twisted deal, man. So those are my two um, stories from 2013 concerning my business. Oh, but there's more, guys. Don't think that I can ever do that short of a video with my big mouth. All right, we're back at my real page, huh? And you know I'm getting ready to step in it. So, interesting story last night, or this morning, because of course, I've been going on at midnight and then uploading and I will no matter what, speak every day this week. So after I did my video last night, which was about the $95 million stock, I hope you guys all know about that. Maxim Shashenko and Yataco Uranium. But anyhow, you know, when I uploaded it, it was really weird. It told me I couldn't upload it. And it says, come back later, you know. But oddly enough, it had already uploaded in another place. So where it uploaded in the other place, it was marked private. And I thought, well, shit, maybe if I turn this other one, you know, on the video editor to, to private, then I'll be able to do it. And that's exactly what happened. But it uploaded publicly after it went through the private status. And you know, the first person I'm sending it to is my buddy, Randy Moggins, because many of you may or may not know, but we're telepathic um, partners in crime that catch bad guys. So today he shared a little post and of course it's red. <laughs> and it says, how very interesting. Suddenly, Facebook has my post marked as private by default. Yeah, that's an inside joke. 
and hey, Mr. Moggins, I got your inside joke. Now, I don't want you to choke or get pissed off or fed up, but our images are being prostituted, dude. So I made this post 50 minutes ago. I hope you're resting peacefully because I know you're not posting right now. It said something about uh, even people with OCD know when to stop. But since I don't have OCD and I'm, I'm just naturally obsessive and fiery as a Pisces, you see, I ain't stopping. So this says, oh snap, Randy Moggins, you and I are still at Conscious Consumer Network. The time warp is all wackadoo. Our images are caught up in fundraising. Should we give? Ha ha. <laughs> All right. So for anybody that doesn't know, uh, CCN is who ripped me off over $4,000. I mean, three grand on a website I don't have. So by the way, if you ever come to my page or you look for me, um, don't believe that I'm at suespratt.com because they shut that shit down. Took my photos, show, you know, all my stuff. But the good thing about being excessive is you always cover your ass and you always have it backed up. Plus, you can always make more. See, because I'm a creative person that really does make my own stuff where somebody like this uses other people's stuff and rides on it for free and scams money. So please don't do this. This is the CCN Systems Repair and Replace Fundraiser. But what I do want you to notice is that you will see, this is for 2017, and you're going to see Randy Morgan's mug and my happy ass. And neither one of us have been there since 2016. And of course, that's a whole other story. But let's get on with the fundraiser. Everybody get their checkbooks out. Conscious Consumer Network was designed to create a live broadcast. Blow me sideways, Mel. Fucking YouTube. And has been live on the air Ugh. since the 1st of January, 2015. Mm-hmm. CCN gets millions of minutes watched. There's Mel. And There's Biggie Blowhole. Oh, I'm sorry, Biggie Blowhole. My bad. produced around 1,400 shows and counting. And you know, it's very hard to get on the mainstream the Venus media. Project. The Venus Project. That's getting tighter and more monopolized and more restrictive for any outside information. The live broadcasts are free to view. Zen Gardner. All shows are archived in high definition on YouTube. All right, let's watch. There I am. There's Randy. Huh. Oh, and look, they got a spaceship for a broadcasting place now. That's nice brand new social media platform that is free to use and has been created for those I thought it was in your apartment, Mel. That's what you told us. To hmm. come together and co-create the solutions to a better world. Due to the uh, usage, yeah. we have needed replenishing and replacing yeah, we'll key hardware and infrastructural wear and tear. Her computer is sick. This includes the fixing and replacing of parts of the live broadcast equipment system, as well as increasing storage capacities for content and projects. Without this, CCN and its affiliate projects will simply not be able to continue. Fivers. Conscious Consumer Network is a publicly funded project, and it's up to you all to keep CCN on the air. Support our funding drive with a donation will become a monthly pledger. Be thank you all for supporting yes. free and independent media. Mm -hmm. All I got to say is, you know, a lot of people call me a fool for falling for it to begin with. 
but you know when you when you carry love in your heart like that you're naturally going to trust people until they give you a reason not to now what's comical about this is that okay if we consider randy's uh time loop theory and we see the danger in this year now 2017 as we see the danger back in 2013 well now this is some pretty serious shit because you have to ask yourself why would somebody like incredible randy moggins be hanging out with those vile creatures and why would he bring me into it susie innocent right i mean because really you know i had no clue as to any of it but as an intuit and a remote viewer and legacy to mama lil and as the person that got called up on the computer to speak the truth i yeah i guess i i do see it but of course i had no clue at that time so my dear friend randy of course is now wildly well known in the community for bringing forward um you know the story behind the cory good saga that would have to do with the other side of the story that needs to be told not just the piece of fluff propaganda that the machine makes up right well in the same way randy brought that kind of action to the zen garner story and what happened <clears throat> was when he brought that story um mel and biggie weren't very happy and at the same time i was in what they call journalism academy which was a scam i didn't know that when i paid him the 250 dollars for that either but you know, I thought I was going to learn to use the computer from Biggie Blowhole, right? Richard Fermay, a.k.a. Dick. Yeah, that's him. Okay. So he was going to teach me how to use the computer. And Mel was going to teach me how to use iMovie. Right. And what I'm hearing in Academy is a bunch of smack on not just Randy or Duncan or um, a whole host of other people that I've mentioned in other videos. I'm not even going to waste the time trying to do it right now. You know, the, it bothered me. I mean, a lot that they were talking that way about Randy because what they were trying to do was brainwash me and convert me over. I, I know... I know how these programs work, believe me. I'm the queen of stress. I have been targeted my entire life. And her dumbass um, actually believed that what could happen to you online was way worse than in real life and I could never be prepared. And oh yeah, she was one of the main people telling me don't tell my story because professional journalists online, which I'm not, do not share their personal and you must separate personal from professional. No, that's the way you hide your dirty little secrets. And like I done told everybody, there's no secrets, come on. So anyhow, what I decided to do <laughs> of my own imagination was to turn on a camera and give them enough rope to hang themselves, which I did. And in the state of Missouri, legally, you only need one person to know the recording is happening. So 
I want to give you guys like a little handy tip from your holistic stylist, right? Let's say a solicitor calls you on the phone and you answer the phone and you say hello. And they say, you know, this is Joe Schmo calling you on a um, secure line and this call is being recorded. And I say, great, let me go get my recording device. I'll be right back. And they say, oh, no, 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 we can't allow you to record it. And I'm like, really? Why well, can't allow me to talk to people that don't allow me to do what I want to do? And they don't know what to say. So there's, there's, there's another little handy tip. Um, anytime you think you got to take shit from people on the phone that don't even have a shred of professionalism, you know that algorithm's got you, man. That's one of the easiest ones to walk away from. No worries. So I've often wondered, huh, what is in Mel's head? I mean, what the hell is wrong with you? Why would you do this to somebody that really just did nothing but give full commitment? Well, now that I get the whole intellectual property thing and, you know, I've never seen so many, uh, it's like a bunch of guys comparing their package size, you know, in the bathroom peeing, like, well, I said it first. No, I said it first. I said it first. Uh, what, what, what rock have you been living under, you know? And part of all having a, collective consciousness is you know these strong strong myths and legends that resonate through archetypes and different timelines and different dimensions you see um really nobody has an original thought under the sun unless they're the divine creator and I just can't believe. But anyhow, right here's, um, you know, the way I document evidence too, is when someone responds. And so, bless Shiva Burton's heart. Here she says, Suze, I just came across this. Mel is full of it. The game's up. This year is time for action. $3,000? Have I got that right? They scammed you and wrecked your computer too? They're disgusting. Right. And do you know, to this very day, my iMovie is still messed up because Biggie did something in there and see, he did it through TeamViewer. He opened the back door of TeamViewer. So whenever he wanted, he could dig around in my computer. Richard did. And of course, I still have all this proof. And uh, this year, you know, they've been hiding. And the way Mel kicked off um, the year was by saying that they had been hacked <laughs> and their lines had been cut and they were going to sue the phone company and dip it, dip it, dip. And they might even need to move secret location. And of course, um, she has opened her big mouth just this week and uh, she did a panel group with a couple other gals. Her favorite subject is, um, you know, white genocide in Africa. And she's been caught sounding a little fishy a couple of times. Hey, uh, I wanted to play you that song again, but I think I'm gonna bring you something else. And this was beautiful today. Um, you know my friend, Mr. Vic, right? Well, Mr. Vic and his wife, Carmen, they celebrated their anniversary today. And this guy is living like a great spirit. And he's playing the piano. So 
I want to introduce you to this dude and uh, let you see what he's about. This is Harry Volkler. Very impressed. You know, oops, I'm playing this music. <clears throat> oh, it's one of those things like, you know, when you say you're always on my mind. I mean, it has got to be really, really tough to be somebody that, uh, they have so much pain from their past that no matter whoever they meet in their present, they can't like form a relationship and really Mel did believe we were sisters and I felt the sisterly bond. But it's like one of them bad sisters, you know, and I gotta tell you, I've only got one brother, James Dean Glasscock. And um, him and I didn't work for the same team either. So I always think of him and deep down love him, but I wouldn't take it from him either. So. As long as we can carry the love with us, like what this guy's doing, I think we can talk just about anything. Talk about it, confront it, bring it forward. And he does it with such flair. Yeah. This is really always on my mind. I know, I hear you, Harry. God love you. Wow. Yeah, Harry's something. Just, uh, just found him today. And I do really have to do this real quick before I blow out a Dodge, too. Um, this, and I know, I know, they get people to do whatever they want. But, you know, I'll always take the opportunity to do what I want, too, right? So, this says, Dear Mr. Computerhead at Facebook, Thank you for this witness concerning what the fuck I'm doing here. Although on one hand, we realize there are no secrets and you hold the key to Lord knows what. I have always kept the faith that we will transcend this crap and be moral, ethical, and loving here in our little web. Love you, Sue's. So this is what Facebook made for me and I, I do think it's very insightful and I want to thank them for it and say hi to the friends that they put up here, just so you know who you are. Sure, Courtney Brown and the remote viewer is right. I hear you. Now 
have is my graduation picture from beauty school. There's a piece of history for you. Hey, look, Vinnie Divine, there you are. That's right. So I thought that was pretty cute, too. And um, we need to say, and this was eight hours ago, so there's a huge energy shift going on right now. It's going to be interesting to see how it shifts. And uh, yeah, I should have remembered to tell you this since I'm rolling up the screen. Let me just read you this. CCN Conscious Consumer Network to launch New Year's Day 2015 as the Dutch police harass and arrest Director Mel V. Right. Too bad um, I didn't know about Google search then, huh? That would have that would have been nice. Okay. So we got my girl. I love this song, but I also got to show you this, and this is back to the hair shop. I know I jumped around a little bit, but <clears throat> when we go back to the computer in 2013, this was the year that uh, I was encouraged very strongly by this town to get on the city website. And of course, when I went to put my information in, the girl that runs the hair shop that didn't want me here, Ferguson Style and Spa, Sherry, hi. But anyhow, um, you know, she's looking at me like, I'm the most lying piece of shit because I'm typing my stuff in like this, right? And she says, I didn't think you knew how to work a computer. And I said, well, I'm not a moron. I surely know how to type. I just didn't choose to be on the computer. Now you gave me a reason to. But this is an article that was written about me. And I'm just going to read you a couple paragraphs. I can't remember exactly where I met Suze Pratt for the first time. But I do know that I liked her immediately. Suze is just one of those people who radiates positive energy. And as soon as we started talking, I felt like I had reconnected with a long lost friend. A petite redhead and certainly old soul, Suze has a nurturing personality that feels like a nice warm blanket on a cold day. She's also what you might call a visionary salon owner. Visionary not because she was the first board certified hair colorist in the state of Missouri, or because she was a pioneer in the development of non-toxic hair color. No, Suze is a visionary because she truly has a vision. Formerly the owner of the Hair Emporium in Florissant, the veteran cosmetologist recently fulfilled a longtime calling by moving her business to cozy old storefront in Ferguson, renaming it the Emporium Salon. Um, Right there is where we're going to stop that because believe it or not, the only reason that I added another name to my fictitious name statement, which costs $7 and it's no big deal, is because they wouldn't allow me to call it Hair Emporium. So we went with the Emporium Salon Spa and Wellness Center. That's how much shit I've been through. Sometimes I think I just want a big U-Haul truck and I'm going to be a gypsy and travel around and do all of my things wherever I want. But in the meantime, right here. The ugly truth behind beauty products. Yes. 
Hey, do you know my buddy Mel was a hairdresser too? And believe it or not, she was famous for ripping off salons in London, getting them to buy into too much product and sign contracts. Probably another reason why I never did uh, relate to my sister too well. See, I like people that are true blue, man, and not full of shit. Oh, hey, speaking of full of shit, look at you. Now, um, I got to get off here, man, because my buddy C.W. Chanter, and see, he's hooked up with Mel and Biggie and uh, Z and a few other nemesises, and he just got done with a show called Feelings, Lyric Analysis and Review, and I'll bet you I know what that's about because, see, they've got their little secret um, spy network and they hang out on Zoom and talk shit all night and talk in code, but I like to show up. And yeah, I think it was very childish that you mocked Randy after he was so kind and jovial to you coming on your tweaked out show. Oh, all right, all right, all right. I gotta go, man. I gotta go. Peace, love, and light from the Big Yellow House on the Third Cosmic Ray in Sue's world, your world, our world. Let's take it back. I'm, I'm going out with my song, In Your Head by E-W-E-Y-W-A. I love this girl. Oh, and she messes it up. This is the dude. Look what I'm doing. I'm showing you the $95 million guy. Look, I got to go. I got to go. I love you guys. And um, I'll talk again tomorrow. And believe me, I'll come with something that'll make you say, hmm. <laughs> Bye.